Ladies and gentlemen, now hosting the Rizzo cast, put your hands together for Steven Risotto. What is happening, everybody, and welcome. This is episode number 105 of RizzoCast. I'm Steven Risotto, and today we are joined by a very special guest, Larry Kruger, formerly of KMBR and ESPN Radio. Um, he now hosts The Krug Show on YouTube, so go, uh, go catch that. It, he's on all the time, um, every part of the day. I'll link it in the, the bio or the description um but larry welcome how you doing and uh, hope you're doing well man oh i am doing great man I, thanks for having me on Stephen. i appreciate it and uh good to talk to you yeah and, and first of all i mean i mentioned the uh the krug show it's a little bit of a different look than a lot of us are used to seeing you doing uh we're used to hearing you on the radio kind of midday tell us a little bit about you know what gave you the urge to to get right back into sports after uh after the whole debacle with KMBR was finished. Yeah. I mean, it's just uh, kind of the, I mean, I've been looking to move to YouTube for a couple of years now. Um, I was trying to you know, influence KMBR to go in that direction to kind of start streaming um, because it's pretty clear that the audience is migrating to digital and you can stay in, in your AM radio lane or FM radio lane. Um, but you're going to wind up losing effectiveness and you're not going to be talking to as many people. And, uh, um, I have four kids of my own and my, I, you know, I, I basically was rolling around one day talking to my, uh, oldest son. And I said, how much time do you and your friends actually spend on, on terrestrial radio? And he's like, dad, honestly, none, none at all. <laughs> I'm like, all right. Well, you know, that's not good. <laughs> you know, that's not a good thing. So it's been a clear migration to the, to, you know, we're now getting almost all of our media consumption comes through our phone. Now I'm, I still have cable television. I still listen to the radio. Um, but the person that's 10 years younger and 20 years younger, you know, feels totally emboldened to cut the cord and not watch cable television. And they're not listening to AM radio or FM radio. They're, they're in a digital platform world. And they want to consume all 100% of their media through the digital platform. And so we're seeing the explosion of YouTube. And uh, now I'm just adding to it. Yeah. And I'll, I'll give you a little insight here. I'm 20 and I still listen to radio when I'm driving, of course. Um, sure. And the good thing about YouTube is that you could always hook it up. Nowadays, there's the technology where you could hook it up to your TV and right. uh, you can watch it on your TV. So, I mean, I don't know uh, if you like that image of, of people wa uh, having your face on their, their big screen TV. Uh, I'm sure Scary. you do <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> after being on radio for all these years and they could even go in the car and plug their little Bluetooth thing in and they could hear you like it would be a radio. So there's, there's so much more flexibility, I think with it. Uh, and it's definitely great. And you can monetize, I guess, when you get to that point. Uh, yeah. So there's so much upside to it for sure. Um, now, this is a baseball podcast, and you talk a lot of baseball uh, yeah. on the new show, especially you do a lot of Giants postgame shows. Um, we are almost two months into the season, I think, at the 40-game mark or around it. The Giants 22-18 and 18 at this point, at the time of this recording, and third uh, in, the, in a very, very good nationally Western division. Give me some of your, your takeaways here uh, within the first uh, 40 games. What do you think? Well, I wanted to see them add more offense in the off season, and they tried. It sounded like they they went after Seiya Suzuki, and they lost out on a bid to the Cubs. Um, <clears throat> then there was a, a pursuit, I guess, of Trevor Story, and they lost out on Story. Maybe luck, luckily, because he's gotten off to a cold start. So I was just, you know, the mindset that after winning 107 games, and despite the fact that the prospects are maybe the bulk of them are more like two years away, maybe that they were still, they were going to dial up some aggressiveness as far as an off season pursuit of a hitter. And I like the addition of Jock Peterson. I just would, would have liked to have seen them add maybe one or two more pieces to the mix. I'm trying to keep it all in perspective here in the early season. Why? Because I know Farhan, you know, I've talked to Farhan a bunch of times and I, he, I, he's won me over. I'm won over by his intellect. I'm won over by his competitiveness. And I just really believe that even if today in May, they don't have the cast 
of characters on their 25 man roster that they need I, before I'm going to, you know, sit there and talk about doom and gloom, you know, you have to really take into account the relative wealth of this franchise. Uh, they have a stadium that's paid for. They have a payroll that's far south of where their payroll has been in previous seasons. So I think it's reasonable to believe that they have the pockets, deep pockets to add whatever player they want to add and use, you know, their financial might to get it done. Um, maybe that's in the form of a trade that at mid season, or they also have the prospect capital to operate as far as a trade goes. You know, if they want to trade any number of, you know, they've got a much deeper crop of, of top 100 prospects than they did five years ago. So, you know, prospects are capital in, in, in today's MLB. And then, so those are the, the two things you need are prospects and money. And they're relatively rich in both areas. So as much as I don't love what I'm seeing right now, I do believe in Farhan. I do believe in his intellect. I do believe in his competitiveness. And I think he'll, he'll continue to make adjustments. That being said, I'm a little disappointed with how they left their 25-man roster to start the year. But they're not buried. As you said, they're over 500. Uh, it's a really competitive division. But it's also a league that added an extra playoff team. And I think that they're, they're going to be right in the mix to fight for a playoff spot. And it's very unlikely they're going to win the division this year because LA and San Diego look really powerful. We just saw San Diego. They rolled in over the weekend and just served up a clinic. I mean, Manny Machado is, is absolutely white hot right now. He's just crazy hot. And Will Myers is like Joe DiMaggio in San Francisco for some reason. So um, they swept that series and made the Jack. And look really, really bad. I think there's a lot of Giants fans that are upset to this morning. But I think if you keep it all in perspective, understand what we're looking at, understand they won 107 last year. They got a really smart GM and really rich team. I think there's reason to believe that in the weeks ahead that they will make the necessary moves to, to add to their 25 man. And I think it will be enough for them to squeeze into the playoffs. And you mentioned the the depth with the prospects. And I always think back to the the era of 2012 to maybe 2014, 15, when they had, you know, the Adrianzas and the Gary Browns and the Mac Williamson. <laughs> None of them really worked out. And now this group that they have now are very highly touted with, uh, especially some of the international talent they have with Marco Luciano and Luis Matos and such. Um, and one of those guys that is making an impact, or I don't know if you could say that uh, completely, but who's trying to make an impact right now is Joey Bart. And I want to ask you about Joey Bart. Um, nobody, and I could speak on behalf of everybody in the front office or everybody in the work, nobody's expecting Buster Posey. I don't even think fans are expecting Buster Posey's stat lines or his offensive numbers or even his uh, ability to work with the pitching staff. That was established day one in Scottsdale. So he's he's got among the highest strikeout rates in baseball right now to open up the regular season. Here we are, May 23rd. I mean, what do you do with Joey Bart? Do you stick with him? Do you play him? Kirk Casale's had a few good starts recently. He's on the IL now with a concussion. Where do we stand right now with, with Joey Bart? What do you think? Well, first of all, let's look at what he did last year. He hit 294 at AAA. I always look at AAA as far as the PCL. There's a, probably a 60 to 80 point difference in what you're going to hit. Whatever you hit there, you're about 60 points north of what you're probably going to hit. So when you look at 294, I was expecting him to hit 230. He had a decent first month. He hit 214. Um, he's, he's, you know, sub 200 in May. And he's striking out like 45% of his at-bats. Um, so as much as I like him and as much as I, you know, still have hope for him in the future, um, you know, it, it, sometimes it takes guys a while. I, I saw Matt Williams recalled in 1987 and it took him, you know, he, he, he was up and down in 87, 88. I think it wasn't until really 89. It took him like three years of, of riding that triple a major league back and forth to kind of get, you know, enough at bats to have a real better. So he could even hit for a low average. He was never going to be a batting champion, but you know, it took him a while to adjust to the big leagues. The one thing about the big leagues, it's different than the minor leagues is, I mean, forget the talent, the talent's all better, 
but the the minor leagues they don't have really advanced scouts they just have scouts and the, it's all kind of word of mouth in the big leagues there's a guy who maybe makes a six-figure salary who's as respected as scouts as, as there is whose job it is to turn off your offensive faucet and these guys do that they find out okay, this guy can crush the fastball, but guess what? Throw him a slider with two strikes. As long as you throw it over the plate, he's going to aggressively swing at it. And, he, and if you throw, keep that pitch in the dirt, he'll swing over the top at it. So, you know, I think that there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, it's pretty clear that he's struggling. I think he needs to be farmed out. I do. I think he needs to be farmed out and he needs to regroup in the minor leagues. And give Casali when he comes back, kind of the everyday reps at catcher. Well, I mean, he's not an everyday catcher either. Um, can you still got me there? Yeah. Uh, he's not an everyday catcher either. I would say, you know, the whole Papirski trade for Dubon was just to add another catcher that they can kind of promote back and forth. But I think this is a problem that they're going to have to address going forward this summer. I mean, they might have to consider trading for a, a Wilson Contreras or somebody like that. Um, you know, uh, maybe a Tucker Barnhart, you know, from Detroit or I don't know. There's, they're, they're really going to have to look long and hard at this because Casale is a defense first backup catcher and his bat is not that great. And Bart at this point looks like he's not ready to take a regular time. I mean, he strikes out a ton. He's, he seems like he's the kind of guy that it's only a matter of a week or two before he starts taking his offensive struggles into the field with him. So I, I just think that, you know, so he doesn't get buried um, and he doesn't lose all confidence. It might be important in the next you know few days actually to farm him out, get him off the, you know, the treadmill of, of being a major league baseball player and let him just relax and go down there and work on his game. Um, and then let's see what he looks like later this year. You know, maybe he can build, maybe last year he hit 294. Maybe if he gets right in the minor leagues, they can get his average up to like 320, 330. And now maybe you call him up in July or August and he's a totally different player. I know that sounds like wishful thinking, but that I've seen that with players in the past. And it wouldn't shock me if they tried to, you know, do exactly that. Farm him out, coach him up try to try to get him ready, build his confidence back and then bring him back in August. And one guy that that happened to during his rookie season was Brandon belt and Brandon belt who uh, was shuttled back and forth from Fresno in 2011. Uh, fast forward now to more than 10 years later. And here he is playing a big part of this team. He just went on the IL uh, with some, uh, some right knee uh, inflammation. He's been dealing with that. It's been surgically operated on twice now uh, but you know, the, as much as we hear about the belt wars and I mean, you were on radio, you got the calls and you got the, the angry fans calling up and, you know, trade branded belt for years. And here he is now since the start of 2020, if you look at the numbers, if you look at, I think it was weighted, uh, runs created plus or OPS plus he was like fourth in all of baseball since 2020 behind like Tatis and Soto and, and trout and a few of those guys, so he's a big part of this offense and he goes down now. What does this kind of mean for the giants? I know they've kind of operated without him before, you know, you could plug in Darren Ruff and Wilmer Flores at first base, but how is it, how important is Brandon belt to this team's offense, especially an offense right now that's kind of struggling to put runs on the board. Oh, he's crucial. He's absolutely crucial. He reminds me of Jack Clark and I'm dating myself. This is well before your time, but the giants used to have a hitter in the seventies and early eighties, Jack, Jack, Clark, the Ripper. Played, Jack, the Ripper, the <laughs> dude, they called him the dude. Um, and he was Brandon belt. He could carry when he got hot, he could carry the team by himself for weeks at a time. Belt did that. I thought early in the season, he was carrying the club. Um, but then they're also very similar and they both had great batting eyes and they were the kind of guys that, you know, um, often got often get billed as they can't do it in the clutch because, you know, they take a lot of pitches and, and Jack would hit one out maybe in the third, but maybe he would take a called third strike in the seventh and people would be like, ah, see, he can't do it in the clutch. And people may have made the same claim about Brandon belt. Um, you know, if, it, it, both these guys, when you when you're watching guys who have a great eye and they're willing to take a strike three, 
it's easy to be like, ah, that passive approach doesn't work. But then you watch Belt in the playoffs and the Giant, and he's been a very consistent producer for the Giants when they've gotten to October. So I'm, I've always been willing to cut him more slack just because to me, that is the bottom line. How do you do when your team, when the lights shine brightest and there's the most pressure? And he's come through for them in October. Um, you think of the home run against the Nationals in the 16th inning, but there's many, many times where he puts together great at-bats. He's like a lock to get to 3-2. He'll get there if it's 3-0. He'll get there if it's 0-2. I mean, almost every at-bat, he's 3-2. I think his approach is really, really good. Um, I think he's a really good defensive player. I like Brandon Bell, and, I, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge supporter of Brandon Bell. I think he's a key guy for their chemistry. I think he's, you know, he's a homegrown kid. He's a big, you know, he's a big, I call him a kid. He's now obviously a veteran. But, I mean, he's a, he's a big guy who came with a lot of fanfare, and when he's going good, you're like, wow, this, this is one of the great offensive players in the game. And then he goes in a funk and he goes bad for a few weeks. And then you're like, well, the streakiness. And, but I think overall, uh, I think he's proven his value. And what we saw last year per at bat was far and away his best production. And he's continued it right into this year. So to me, going forward, I think he's a lifelong giant. And I think he is a, a giant that it's a lot of it's going to be predicated on his health. Um, and there's going to be times where you're going to be like, damn, he's passive and he takes too many pitches. But then there's going to be other times where he's hot, he's carrying the team. So, um, but you, your initial question is how important is it? It's vitally important that they ride him because he's 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 in the prime of his career, and he's when he's healthy, he's a force. And he's going to get this knee thing figured out. I know he said yesterday after the game at his locker that it was frustrating because he couldn't find a rhythm this year. He can't find a rhythm every time that he's, every time he gets hot for a week, the next week he's out with an injury. So he's trying to get back on. And I think the giants are expecting him back in Cincinnati. So uh, at the end of the, uh, the next road trip, that's the final series. Um, and I saw a tweet of yours and this is the million dollar question. I'm like, Oh, we're going to have a field day with this one. So I saw a tweet of yours just the other day. The nationals have uh you already know where I'm going with this. The Nationals. I was hacked. Uh, I was hacked. <laughs> <laughs> You're hacked. I don't buy yeah. it. Uh, the National, according to Buster Only, Buster Only wrote an article, and I guess he talked to a rival baseball executive of um, who, you know, I guess knows the Nationals pretty well. And that executive said that the Nationals could very well be in a position to trade Juan Soto uh, at the trade deadline, or, you know, he's got a few years left, so maybe next year too. Um Aaron Judge, meanwhile, is a free agent to be, um, certainly will have Giants ties. You know, he's he's a local guy, grew up a Giants fan or whatnot. Um, and, and the Giants seem to be linked to every big name outfielder since Barry Bonds, right? So there's going to be rumors around Judge. There's going to be rumors around Soto. Which one makes more sense? Well, you know, it's funny. I threw this out and, you know, the, the answers that I liked the most were people who said both. <laughs> you know, get them both. One guy in free agency, one guy in trade. Um, and the more I thought about it, the more I thought, yeah, what the heck? Why not get them both? Um, here's the question. You, you know, you're going to have to bid a ridiculous amount for judge judge is a fixture in New York. They love them there. Um, they would love to keep them, but I think judge would do more to sell tickets. Now, um, you know, he, he's such a, he's such a Ruthian figure and he's a right-handed power hitter, but he's also 30 and he's had some injuries. And so that potentially could be, you could look really bad. You know, when you pay Farhan, does he want to pay top dollar for, you know, the, the guy and, you know, the key bat in a, in a free agent market and then inherit basically his age 31, 32, 33 season of a player who's had some injuries that could be painful, but at the same time, uh, if you trade Kyle Harrison and Luis Matos and Marco Luciano to the Nationals, uh, that could bring incredible pain. I said that I would probably lean towards keeping the prospects and, and signing Judge. But to me, if I could make the deal by trading a lot, you know, premier prospects, but holding on to the ones that I really wanted to hold on to, like, to me, I, the guys that I like the most, um, I liked Canario last year who they traded for Chris Bryant. 
And I thought his bat speed was Sammy Sosa like, and, and he's continued on in the minor leagues this year, having some great highlights, but who knows? I mean, he's a ways away. Prospects don't always make it. Oftentimes they flame out. I mean, I can think of so many that have flamed out through the years. So I'm not fearful of trading prospects, but there's a couple guys I don't want to trade. I don't want to trade Luis Matos. I just think there's electricity in his wrists. He can play center field. I think he's a foundation piece. I'd like to keep him and I'd like to keep Kyle Harrison. Now, if I can make a trade with my prospect base and keep those two guys, it's a no brainer. I'm trying to get Soto. And I, I, what is Mike Rizzo even thinking? Why would they even consider trading uh, trading Juan Soto? He's 23. I mean, there's, there's, there's top tier prospects who, you know, aren't going to reach the level Soto's reached by 27 and he's 23. So I, it's a tough one. I'd probably lean towards the free agent, but if I could make the right kind of prospect deal, I, uh, man, I'd love to have Soto because unlike the uh, judge who's 30, Soto's 23 and you could get, you know, you could get some primo years out of Soto. I, I think he, he's, he's likely to be one of the national league's better hitters for the next decade. You know, a thousand percent. And, and, you know, we talked about belts knowledge of the strike zone. Soto has that, I think times two and just watching him in the national series, there's nobody that has better plate presence than Juan Soto and who just makes himself known at the plate um, and just the most competitive way possible. Uh, and who has got power, all fields, drives the ball to the opposite. I remember last year he drove a ball to left field that was going out against Di Sclafani. Remember Talkman made the big catch and uh, Di Sclafani went on to throw a, a one nothing shutout. Uh, so Soto's got power everywhere, and he's just a, a guy who right now everybody's comparing him to Ted Williams at this point in his career, and granted 23 years old. I mean, maybe slow down a little bit, but definitely that's the path that I think he's going down. Um, and, and speaking of local kids, I mentioned Judge was kind of a local guy. Um, well, unfortunately, you went to SI, but that's that's uh-huh. neither here nor there. Uh, child of the 80s and 90s, you know, growing up in the Bay Area, you've seen kind of the, the evolution of baseball, um, you know, since you know, the steroid era before then to now, the three true outcomes and all that. What are some of the big changes that you've kind of noticed um, from those days to today? And I'm not trying to date you here, Larry. I'm just trying to say, what are some of the, because there's been changes so much here. Uh, in the game of baseball with rule changes and different philosophies and money ball and all this, if you had to narrow it down, what would be some of the big changes that you've noticed that have really changed the game? Well, I mean, to me, one of the most significant changes has been a bad change. And that is there's hardly any African-American players in the game. Um, And that's, that's hurt the game. There's just no other way to say that. I don't think there's any question. I mean, Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, Willie McCovey, Frank Robinson. I mean, so many great players, um, you know, and there's not, they're choosing other sports and they're, and they're getting priced out, you know, and I'm, I have boys who play baseball and it gets very costly at the high school level to play these travel ball teams. And it, it aces out, you know, um, many, many players, many, many families. And they're, and I'm sure there are kids that were going to be really good at baseball. And then they're, they, you know, they didn't have a lot of money and they looked at what it would cost to play summer baseball. And they're like, well, I'm not going to ask my mom for $1,700. I know she doesn't have that. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you know, play basketball or I'm just going to play football or I'm just going to play nothing, you know? So I think baseball needs to figure out how they can get the pipeline of athletes in America to play their sport in greater number, because now we're noticing it at the major league level, major league baseball is less dynamic to watch in 2022 than it was in 1982. Uh, What other sport in America can you make that claim about basketball is more dynamic than it was in the eighties. The NFL is more dynamic than it was in the eighties. The athletes are bigger, stronger, faster. Um, But in baseball, they're not in baseball they're uh, it's less dynamic and there's less stolen bases and there's less athleticism and there's less of a show, you know, and, and then, then you mix in the three outcomes of walk strikeout and home run. And there's just not a lot of action in a baseball game. You know, I've got, I've got, uh, as I said, four kids, I got three boys that all play baseball 
And they love relatively compared to the average person. They love baseball. Well, they might be following along through like the Bleacher Report app and will come down if there's like a rally or something. Other than that, you know, they're, for the most part, they're not as engaged day to day on Giants baseball as they should be. Um, and I mean, think about it. If you can't get a, 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 a boy who's playing high school baseball to be interested in what your, your major league baseball, then who, who's interested, right? If a, who's interested in major league baseball, if a 16 year old boy would rather watch something else on his phone than watch a baseball game, who's playing baseball, who plays baseball, you know? So that, I just think baseball has through some horrendous leaders, Bud Selig was a horrendous commissioner. Rob Manfred is equally horrendous. He just described the World Series trophy as a hunk of metal. I mean, he doesn't, in no way does he represent anything other than money. Um, and I, I just think that horrendous leadership has gotten them to this point. They've lost a generation of fans. They've allowed other people to paint their sport as old and white and out of touch, non -in non-inclusive. And they're not fighting back. So guess what? Guess what you get for that baseball? You get smaller market share and you're, you know, I mean, ESPN tells you a lot about, about where they rank these sports by how they group them on ESPN.com. You'll see NFL, NBA, then oftentimes like NASCAR and all these different things. You got to go down the list before you're going to find MLB. MLB has become a regional sport. It, there's no national ties. Nobody can name anybody. I mean, I don't care if you're hardcore. You go up and you, took, you take a poll and you go on the street in downtown San Francisco. And the first question you ask is, are you a hardcore baseball fan? Okay, that's the first question. And everybody else who says, no, I'm not a hardcore baseball fan, you're like, thank you, have a good day. So if you say I'm a hardcore baseball fan, great. And then you said, um, what team is Phil Kevin Kiermeyer on? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. So I'm a baseball fan. And if baseball fans don't know who's on what team, um, that means they're out of touch. You know, Patrick Beverly's Q rating is greater than that of Mike Trout. Mm -hmm. That's not right. That Mike Trout is a 10 times the better baseball player than Patrick Beverly is a basketball player. But basketball has gotten to a point where it's enormously popular. You know, um, there's people that are keenly aware of Jacoby Brissett and they know nothing about, you know, um, Manny Machado. Um, why is that? It's because the NFL and fantasy football is king and, and baseball has allowed itself to, they don't market their stars. They've lost touch with mainstream America and they need to do some things to get it back. And right now you've got players that are wealthy. You've got owners that are wealthy and it's like all a house of cards because in reality, there's the game doesn't resonate the same way as it did even 15, 20 years ago. And that's a real problem. So they need a new commissioner, a new direction, a greater commitment to building academies in America, to developing minority players, to becoming paint itself as more inclusive you know, baseball needs to come to grips with where they're at and where they've been and where they want to go and make some changes. I'm going to clip that off and I'm going to share that everywhere because that that's church right there. So I, I've, I've, you made some great points there. And I think the one that stuck out to me is if you do go on ESPN, uh, like you mentioned, there's football, basketball, then there's that stupid drop down menu that you have to go to and click on baseball. So it's kind of a pain. Um, and, and really, I think the the big thing is, and, you know, I played baseball four years of, of high school and uh, I would go up, I would go to the field and there would be what, like 20 guys on the team maybe. And there would be three of them that I could actually talk to about that previous night's giants game, three of them. And, and I guarantee you, and I'm going to echo everything you said, everybody under the age of 18. And I know this, I like, I lived through it recently. Everybody under the age of 18 does not care about major league baseball. They care about baseball. Okay. Uh, T-ball does really well. Little league still the most popular, uh, popular youth um, league, in my opinion, 
high school baseball, you know, does pretty well. College baseball, a lot of fun. But in terms of watching major league baseball, nobody does it. There's nobody. I could show up to the to the baseball field one day after school for practice and say, who's leading the American League in home runs? And nobody would know. And, and it's just it's it's not a fun thing. And you mentioned the athleticism with the uh, and I had Rennell on who talked about the lack of African-Americans in the game and um, getting priced out. I mean, two hundred and fifty dollars for a glove, five hundred dollars for a bat. Um, I mean, it's it's ridiculous. It really is. And I think that's one of the I don't think baseball's dying. I just think it's in it's dormant right now. It's I mean, there's there's kind of a stopgap right now. Um I'm going to, I'm going to kind of uh, go into a different direction here. Who, who's the best baseball player you've ever watched? Cause I know that there's a few guys that have come through, I guess, San Francisco, maybe that you've, you've seen maybe around the league. If you had to narrow it down to the one guy who you just said, wow, stopped everything. I think I might know the answer to this one, but if there's one guy that you had said, wow, that's the best baseball player I've ever seen. Who is it? Well, you know, it's interesting because it's a things loaded happen. question. Yeah, I mean, I'm probably going to surprise you because oh. um, I mean, obviously Barry Bonds is, That's is, what I was thinking, is yeah. one of the great the greatest hitters I've ever seen, and Barry was an incredible base runner, and Barry was an incredible fielder. He was the greatest left fielder I've ever seen. He really had it all except for a great arm, and he compensated for his great arm by having unbelievable footwork in that left field corner and an incredible release. But he, but to me if I had to say who was the best, I would, the best that I've seen, I, you know, I, I, I know this is going to sound crazy, but I thought Eric Davis for the Reds in the late eighties, you know, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, in that five-year period there, I thought Eric Davis, Eric, the red uh, was was the guy. I mean, he played center field. He made the game look easy, he run like the wind. I mean, the guy had a, as great as Barry Bonds is, he's never had an 80 steal season. I think Eric Davis had a 26 homer, 83 stolen base season. I mean, think about that for a second. Who has 26 homers and 80 something steals? I mean, it's just unbelievable. And he played center field. He had an incredible arm. He made the game look easy. He had bat speed. I mean, Daryl Strawberry was an enormous talent as well, but he didn't quite have the foot speed of Eric Davis. Eric Davis could steal any base. I, I remember seeing him in 86 and 87 thinking, wow, this guy's incredible. Um, you know, so, I mean, Barry, Barry was, inc- I mean, and then Griffey, I mean, it's probably between Griffey and Bonds and Eric Davis. I guess I would, I, I you know, the more I think about it, I probably would have to say Griffey. You know, Griffey played center field. He had this beautiful swing. He was great instantly. Um, he, you know, his body broke down, you know, because he, he his body broke down. But um, I would, those are the guys that I think of. You know, obviously Bo Jackson was an incredible baseball player who played baseball part-time, became an all-star and did certain things on a baseball diamond that like nobody's ever done. Um, and he had unbelievable gifts, but he didn't refine them enough, be, spend enough time in the game. So uh, I would probably, it would be a short list. It'd be Eric Davis, Barry Bonds and uh, Griffey Jr. If I had to say um, one, I guess I would go Griffey because he did it clean. You know, the perception is that he did it clean. Um, and I think he was slightly better than Eric Davis. And, and even though it's funny, I had this conversation with Eric Burns. He's like, I played with both those guys. And there's no doubt that Barry Bonds is, you know, Barry Bonds is, you know, easily the best player ever. That's pretty and good. That's, sounds like him. That sounds like Burnsy. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, so, but I, I'll say, I'll say Griffey. I'll say Griffey Jr. Griffey Jr. has got to play for the Savannah Bananas today, you know. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Griffey Jr. wasn't nearly the hitter that Barry Bonds was. It was nearly the hitter. So I have never seen anybody with his eye. No, yeah, yeah. 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 You got to really put emphasis in the Burns impression, and it, and yeah. then it will then it will really turn out there. Um, and Griffey, if he stayed healthy in Cincinnati, I mean, you're looking at maybe a guy that hits 750 some odd home runs. He ended up with in the 600s, I think. Um, so, I mean, he was, 
he was the man for a long time there. Um, and then uh, before we wrap up, I do want to also ask a lot of radio shows, a lot of radio guests, thousands of them, I'm sure. If there's an interview that you could remember or maybe a person who just like stands out in terms of, of, you know, getting, of interviewing, uh, who just had great quotes or just a, a guy who, or a person that you had goosebumps talking to, who would, who would you always be excited to, uh, to have a conversation with? That's another been, loaded question. I'm just, I'm well, covering there's you so here. many, there's so many, but, um, the one that sticks out is I was at KMBR. It was 1997. I or maybe 1998. I just gotten there for the most part. I was a young guy and I was doing a weekend show with Chris Townsend called the weekend sports insiders. And we basically uh, just came on before and after the weekend games, kind of like Marty, a kind of a precursor to what Marty does now. Um, and um, we're at candlestick and we're in the visitors clubhouse uh, giants, Dodgers, and uh, Vin Scully walks in and Vince, and we said, Hey, Vin, you know, we were, we were bold young guys. And Hey, Vin, you know, we'd be on our show. And he's like, gentlemen, I would love to. And he sits <laughs> down with us and starts spinning yarns about New York city in the fifties and what it was like. And he grew up, he goes, I'll tell you a secret. I was a giants fan. And, you know, um, and he's, you know, all in this Vin voice and, he treated us so well and he was so kind, so gracious, did about a 20 minute interview with him, um, talked Giants, Dodgers, talked 50s, talked, you know, Willie Mays, Duke Schneider, I mean, talked New York baseball. I mean, I would have to say, I mean, I've done many interviews, you know, I love interviewing Steve Young, Steve, Young, Steve Kerr, Burns was one of my favorites, uh, Joe Torre. Uh, the, the late Jack Buck, uh, you know, several that's Mark Cuban that come to mind, Carmelo Anthony. I mean, just all kinds of guys come to mind, but I would say Vin Scully, Vin Scully, 1998 Dodger clubhouse, 20 minutes in the corner of the room. He's got a seersucker suit on. He's telling stories about, you know, out about, uh, about Roy Campanella and, you know stories about Don Newcomb and stories about Willie Mays in the 50s and you know I mean it was incredible it was absolutely incredible a close second I would say is the late great Harry Callis who had this incredible voice of Out Mick of Dutch, Dalton and Mickey Morandini and you know and Harry Callis was the voice of NFL films and the voice of the Phillies smoked a pack a day but man, he, he was so gracious and so kind. And you'd go into his booth and come on, boys, sit down. Let's talk a little baseball. And, and then the late Jerry Coleman, who was, you know, hang a star on that one, Padres, Tony Gwynn. Also, I did an interview with Tony Gwynn at 7 o'clock in the morning. I asked him for an interview on a Friday afternoon uh, at, at Jack Murphy Stadium. And he said, hey, you know, I don't have time right now. But if you come back tomorrow morning at 7, you know, I'll be here. I'll be here. We'll do it. And, and Ricky Henderson standing right there and he looks at me as Tony walked away and he said, are you going to show up at seven? I go, should I? I thought maybe he was blowing me off. He's like, no, he'll be here at seven. If you're here at seven, he'll give you that interview. So I go back there at seven o'clock in the morning. I'm in the clubhouse. I had to have somebody let me into Jack Murphy stadium. And uh, I, I thought he blew me off because I didn't see him in the clubhouse. I'm walking out of the clubhouse. And he's like, Ricky comes out. And he's, he's like, you're looking for Tony. I said, yeah. Remember you told me he'd show up at seven. He's like, he's on the field hitting hitting off the tee with Greg Vaughn. He goes, I'll go tell him that you're, that you're here. And I'm like, you will. So unbelievably Ricky Henderson walked like about, I would say about 500 yards down a corridor onto the field over to home plate to tell Tony Gwynn and Greg Vaughn that some nobody kid from KMBR wanted to do an interview with him. And sure enough, he's like, you hear Tony go, Oh, right. Right. And he comes over and he's like, all right. He poured himself a cup of coffee and he's like, I got all day. What do you need? And he sat down and we sat in the clubhouse and talked hitting uh, for like 20 minutes, half hour. Most amazing thing. Most amazing. I miss that guy. He was a great guy. God, I know SNL is doing all these shakeups. They got to hire you in there to do impressions because, I mean, you've nailed all of them so far. I mean, I always <laughs> think, I guess I could do Scully like the uh, Rad Barber used to say. No, I can't. It's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, no, Tony Gwynn is, I mean, I always listen to, uh, sometimes I, I caught myself on, because I have 
uh, Sirius XM and I listen to games on the way home sometimes. And Tony Gwen Jr. actually does Padres games. And I yeah. like, it was, it was the biggest mind blow. Cause I was like, Oh my gosh, this sounds like Tony Gwen. I thought there was like an archive like audio or something. And it was, no, it was Tony Gwen Jr. Yeah. I was like, wow. He's a great guy, by the way, another mm-hmm. terrific guy. Yeah, no, it was a great, it was, he's, he does a great job for the Padres radio. Um, no, that, yeah, that's really, that's a, that's a all-star cast right there with Ricky Henderson and Tony Gwen and Steve Kerr, you mentioned Steve Young. So yeah, definitely an awesome career. And I guess the next thing we could close it out with this, what is next for Larry Kruger? Is it the YouTube show for a little bit? You looking to get picked up with, you know, somewhere, uh, what's the plan for, uh, for, I guess the immediate future for our guy, Larry Kruger here. Well, you know, that's a great question. Um, I'm doing the YouTube stuff and really enjoying it. I'm planning on continuing that no matter what else I do. I am in, I am talking to um, a couple different entities about different ventures that I'm not ready to announce today, but we may be ready to announce within a week or so. So um, you, you, I, I can't give it away because it's that good, but um, you're going to see me in different spots doing different things and uh, it's all going to be sports related. And uh, I'm in love with my YouTube uh, channel right now and the content that we're putting out. And so that is going to be a staple of what I do. But as far as strategic partnerships and ways to get that out to more people through a broader uh, voice, um, I'm going to pursue all of that here in the next few days. You heard it here first. Larry Kruger is going to be joining Al Michaels on the Amazon NFL telecasts. <laughs> That's right. <year. laughs> That's right. I'm getting, I want $1 more than what Al makes, you know? Uh, no, but Amazon can't do that. They don't have enough money. You got to remember. Yeah, that. exactly. They don't have enough money. <laughs> uh, anyways, Larry, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, this was a lot of fun. And of course, everybody could follow Larry Kruger on Twitter at sports, Larry K. And then I'll go ahead and link in the, uh, the YouTube page. Uh, good stuff. Yeah, if, if there's one thing I would add is, Hey, you know what, if you want to help, you know, lots, I'm overwhelmed by the number of people that have reached out and supported my channel. Uh, you can support me in a number of different ways. There's merchandise that I'm selling at Casera's Italian men's wear. Uh, so Krug show t-shirts, um, but also just like, and subscribe, go to YouTube, hit, hit the Krug show like and subscribe we've got clo- we're closing in on 5000 subscribers we've only been around for about a, about less than 6 weeks um and and then i can't tell you the number of people that have reached out who have sponsored the show so we have six sponsors and we're going to be welcoming on two more um so if there's anybody who wants a sponsor just hit, you know hit me up on the dms on twitter and tell me what your company is. I'll get back to you and we'll figure it out, figure it out if it's mutually beneficial, but just overwhelmed by the number of people that have reached out and said, man, we dig what you do and we dig your content and we want it. And um, so I'm just, uh, you know, I feel really good about it. And all of a sudden Grant Cohn's watching his back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he's got a little empire. He's, he's doing just, just fine. And I personally, I know Grant, Grant's a good guy. He's a yeah. good guy. People who say, oh, Grant, this and that, you know, he's got his angst about certain things and he's got this little cottage industry for sure. But um, he's a good guy. He's helped me out quite a bit. And uh, I, I interviewed Lowell on here and, and Lowell was like, I don't know what he does all day with that thing, with that YouTube. <laughs> so, yeah, he's doing so, really well is what he's doing. Yes, he is doing really well, doing really well. Um, so for sure. And of course, you guys could follow this podcast on Twitter and Instagram at RizzoCast and Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcast, go check it out. New episodes coming up soon. Uh, I think Ryan Terrio is is the next one coming on. I think uh, he'll be on pretty soon. Uh, we're still working out details for that one, but stay tuned for that one. The and, Ryan, uh, he's, the a, he's a good friend of mine. In fact, I'm actually about to call him because isn't he tight with somebody that the Giants just added or? Yes, he's tight with uh, with the new catcher they have, Papirski. He is. He works. Yeah. So Ryan Terrio now owns a gym, um, and he owns a gym in Louisiana. I'm Great blanking. Dude. It. I think it's called Traction Sports, and uh, Papirski worked out there. So there you go. The riot. That would be a good get. Terrio's yeah. the man, man. Tell him like Krug said hi. He's Will one do. of my favorite Giants. 
Will do. All right, everybody, have a good day. And again, subscribe, do all that fun stuff, and see you next time.